And we are now live. Good morning. My name is Robert Brown, and I'm the president of the University of West Los Angeles. I want to welcome you to our fireside chat on MASA, a time for change. This is a very timely and controversial subject and one that is very close to me as my daughter is of Iranian descent. And I can only imagine the terror that is filled with many parents as they are faced with this very dire situation where women cannot walk the streets in certain areas without fear of reprisal for the way that they look. So with that said, again, I'd like to welcome our attendees, our viewers, and our panelists to MASA, A Time for Change, another UWLA fireside chat. I'll turn it over to our moderator, Shay Brown. Shay. Thank you, President Brown, and good morning, everyone. I would like to take a moment to thank UWA and President Brown for allowing us to use this platform and help ampl amplify the voices of the Iranian people. Um, I would also like to take the time to thank our prize panelists for joining us here today. And a huge thank you to Professor Zand and a special thank you to Mrs. Mizrahi and for their efforts in putting this event together on such short notice. So thank you all. Um, just a little background about me, you know, being born in Iran and raised until the age of seven, um, I always knew that Iran would not be our permanent home. It was a childhood dream of mine that was built around leaving Iran one day in pursuit of freedom and a better life. Um, and that's exactly what my mother and I did on a one faithful evening when we decided to took the bus late at night and cross over the border into Turkey and escape the regime for good. Um, this unfortunately is not the same for, this is not the same story shared for everyone else. Um, however, it's been a story that's been echoed for hundreds of thousands of people who have fleed the Islamic Republic and their brutal regime. Um, I personally cannot help but feel an overwhelming amount of grief and sadness for my brothers and sisters um, in Iran, but above all, more than ever, I feel a sense of family, a sense of pride, a sense of unity and empowerment which is the same values that we've echoed throughout the walls of UWLA and a mission that we take great, great pride in. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to our moderator, Mrs. Mizrahi, um, who is also a professor here at University of West Los Angeles. Um, Mrs. Mizrahi, thank you so much for being here today. I will go ahead and turn it over to you and allow you to please introduce our um, esteemed panelists today. Absolutely, thank you, Shay. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you, uh, UWA administration and staff for taking the lead in organizing today's event. My special thanks to UWA President Bram um, and our Dean uh, Freikberg, and also my dearest friend, colleague, and mentor, Professor Zan. Shay, I must say you are a credit to this great institution and your community for taking this initiative to be the voice of young women in Iran, whose voices have been silenced for more than 43 years. These are exceptional circumstances as um, events unfold in Iran. A misogynistic um, government has been imposing its brutal regime um, through uh, fierce um, laws and draconian rules that is imposed on women. But the question is why Iranians are revolting against the Islamic regime in Tehran. Today, we wanna offer a very candid and honest opinion of different individuals covering different facades um, of what is happening in Iran and the reactions to it. The movement started when the morality police in Iran killed a 22 year old woman in custody. But this is more than the literal hijab or the existence of morality police. Women in Iran are treated as far below second-class citizens. They are even deprived of their basic rights. Women legally cannot become presidents or judges. They cannot work without the permission of their fathers 
brothers, sons, or husbands. They are not allowed to travel without the permission of their fathers, brothers, husbands, or a male in the family. That goes the same for education, deciding where to live, or even what to wear. Abortion has always been illegal in Iran. The laws in Iran will not allow women get custody of the minor children after divorce. As a matter of fact, they cannot even initiate divorce against their husbands except for the order of the Islamic court. They are not allowed to sing, not allowed to dance, not attend sports arena to watch a soccer match or even ride a bike. Talking about an apartheid state or modern day, um, slavery, they are mandated to wear a hijab, except in the privacy of their home if the family is not strict. But this is not about women uh, uh, only. The Islamic regime is a corrupted, tyrannical system that from inception has imposed its version of morality on the people of Iran while exporting its revolutionary ideology to the region and elsewhere. Today, we are gonna start with um, our moderator, Mrs. Mitra Behnejad. I have had the pleasure of knowing uh, Mitra for uh, many years. Um, she is a true activist in the sense that her background goes into promotion. And in the past few years, she has taken a long sabbatical to take care of her three beautiful children. Mitra is never um, shy to express her opinions. And today, I really thought hearing her comments would add a lot of value to this panel. So uh, Mitra, the uh, microphone is yours and we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Zohra John. Um, I'm Mitra Behnajad, good morning. Let me preface by saying that I'm not going to give you a polite academic analysis of the crisis in Iran. I am going to be harsh at times, no apologies because I'd like to relay the anger of the youth in Iran. My family emigrated from Iran to Philadelphia in 1964 when I was a preschooler. 64 was way before the, uh, no one was leaving Iran in 1964. That's way before the diaspora of Iranians who were desperate to get out after the 1979 revolution. Well, anyway, leaving Iran in the 60s and the 70s was a really bad time. It was bad timing because the country was slowly becoming a modernized, industrialized, and wealthy nation. There was a, an emerging middle class. The economy was thriving. The oil revenue was transforming what was once a truly, truly backwater Middle Eastern country with a very high illiteracy rate into a modern, thriving sovereign nation. Uh, America was exciting too at the time. There was the civil rights movement. Women were burning their bras. The peace demonstrations against Vietnam was taking place and there was the Cold War. So you were either with the US or you were with the Soviet Union, nothing in between. So Iran chose to be with the US. Hence the ongoing accusations that Iran was a puppet of the US. I never really understood what that meant. At the time, Iran had the largest number of foreign students studying in the United States and worldwide, all of them, all of them on stipends from the Iranian government so they could go back and contribute to the growth and the collective knowledge of their homeland. Iran was really well on its way uh, to becoming the biggest superpower in the Middle East. 
and consequently ensuring peace in the region. So it was very advantageous to the West for Iran to emerge as a stabilizing force uh, for security. Then, then in the late 70s, Iran got what the West would call, actually the good old boys in the South would call too big for its bridges. Iran raised the price of oil, the lifeblood of the West, as you all know, which led to stagnant economic growth in the West as prices surged from $13 to $34, I believe, a barrel. Well, after all, the US had pro uh, raised the price of wheat and other commodities to Iran. So that was only fair. I remember uh, the long gasoline lines when I was in high school. Uh, this really ages me, but that's okay. Um, so Iran went from being an island of peace and stability, according to Jimmy Carter, to a pariah overnight. So began in the West, a campaign of negative publicity and spinning of the news to topple Iran from within and without. Now, in, in those days, um, none of you in the audience probably remember, but in those days, there were only three TV channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. So we had three te uh, television sets going on all at once, 24 seven, so we don't miss a minute of what was going on. In 1979, we sadly watched as chaos reigned in Iran. Uh, the, uh, we watched in horror, literally horror, as Iranians fell into a frenzy over Khomeini and his lies, the deceit, the subterfuge that he was spouting while exiled in France. Oh, so humbly sitting cross-legged under an apple tree in some room, remote village in France. Well, the press goes to town. All foreign cameras, microphones, were focused on him, relishing the trash that came out of his mouth. With the help of the liberal press, the liberal media, this ignorant, lice-ridden, archaic cleric was transformed into a modern prophet, the hidden imam, come back a savior to deliver people from the injustices of, uh, in Iran the harbinger of democracy and freedom, all under the protective umbrella of Islam, as if theocratic rule is compatible with democracy and freedom. I can understand, I can understand the poor and the illiterate Iranians falling for his lies uh, when he promises free rent, free electricity, free water, but the shameful part and, and this is very important. The shameful part is that foreign educated PhDs who came back to Iran in the early 70s, and mind you, they were uh, being paid by the government to study abroad. And these people who held prominent positions in academia and industry also fell under Khomeini's spell. Some of these folks conveniently escaped the horrors of the revolution, and now, they enjoy comfy positions at various universities around the world. Although they are eating pro and they are apologizing profusely for lending an intellectual voice to Khomeini's movement. There was mass hysteria, mass hysteria as people started seeing Khomeini's face on the moon. They would literally open the holy book, the Quran, the Quran. And if there was a strand of hair, they would say it was Khomeini's and God placed it there. All of a sudden, the secular movement that was gaining a foothold in Iran lost its inertia. And people started to rediscover their Islamic roots and identity. Little did they remember that Islam was imposed by the Arabs on Iran 1400 years ago in a very brutal manner, very much like now very much like now. Intellectuals influenced by leftist or Soviet elements decry the lack of democracy in Iran. Well, I put this question uh, onto you. How can democracy flourish in a land where illiteracy exists? Now, I mean, illiteracy was being eradicated, but it still existed. Here's where I'm going to be harsh. How 
if you can't tell the difference between silk democracy and a sow's ear, what are you gonna do with democracy? You're going to listen to your local Friday imam for political direction. No, pretty much like the religious right here in America. Well, propaganda reigned supreme uh, even in the early 70s during the 2500 year celebration of Iran. Uh, this was held up as an example of decadence and excess. British and European papers went to town with this event. The next day, they published hundreds of photos of poverty in Iran, juxtaposed with pictures of heads of state from various countries who were guests of Iran, who were dining on pheasant. Well, uh, quite frankly, I'd like to photograph the homeless tents in downtown LA for the same reason. Uh, not one paper mentioned that this was part of a bigger PR campaign to introduce modern Iran to the world, to invite foreign investment, to increase tourism. How dare, how dare a third world country celebrate itself even after 2,500 years of civilization? Okay. So all this and more contributed to the Islamic Republic, taking hold of the reins of government. This is where I use the ad adage that people who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. How can anyone who knows history, especially the Iranians of the time, especially that revolution, anyone who knows history, how could they think that a religious cleric a kryptonite to progress, if I may, can become a leader of a nation. It's pretty much like the church in the Middle Ages. I have to give you a little bit of history so that Iranians themselves realize where they came from. In the age of colonialism, the British and the Russians devoured Iran. The British were exceptionally clever. They knew that Shiism, is the bait, the gateway to subjugating the Iranians. Their spies pose as clerics to influence people's, um, I, I guess their, uh, uh, their actions, to keep them inactive while, they, while, while the, the, the foreign powers robbed and looted Iran's natural resources through unfair concessions. Russia annexed about one third of the Iranian landmass. Does that sound familiar to anybody with what's going on today? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the places like um, Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Georgia, these were all part of the most fertile, rich, productive part of Iran. During the First World War, nine to 10 million Iranians died. Half the population of the country died of famine, uh, 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 disease, typhus, cholera, all because of the confiscation of foodstuff, hoarding, withholding of food and medicine from the local population for the soldiers. This is a, a genocide that has been uh, little studied by academia. During the Cold War, Khrushchev said that Iran is but a rotting apple. All we have to do is wait for it to fall. So now back to 1979, Khomeini is brought back to Iran courtesy of Air France, where a second flight was chartered as a dummy flight in case of, of foul play. Well, in retrospect, I believe that Khomeini served as a convenient mascot for the West to regain its hold on the Middle East. Little did they know, little did they know that they are opening Pandora's box. And as Iran fell to ugly religious fanaticism, so did the rest of the region. So the Iranians fell victim to a brutal theocracy which controls every aspect, every minute aspect of their lives. Now I shouldn't say fell victim, I, I, because it is their own, it was their own folly, their own stupidity their own uh, Shekhan Sidi, which in Farsi means their bellies were full. And I'm talking about the previous generation, not the present generation who is truly gallant. 
What a great legacy that the previous generation left for the youth of Iran today. Fast forward to the present day. I had to give you that background. I am shocked by the deafening silence of the media. Last weekend, and I'm sure the rest of the panel will cover this more extensively, but I have to say this. Last weekend, about half a million people in various cities in the US and around the world marched in peaceful protest against this regime. Not one major outlet covered it. I mean, hell, the Queen's funeral was covered for about two weeks. Where is Amnesty International, who was so eager to call out Iran in the 70s for alleged human rights violations? Where is the Me Too movement, even though this is bigger than just women's rights or the hijab? Way bigger than women's rights. Men are involved too. Where are the so-called progressives whose principles always take a back seat when it comes to offending religious sensitivities? Why are we not laughing in the face of medieval titles like supreme leader, God's representative on our earth, morality police? Are these progressives afraid of being canceled due to Islamophobia? I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to go there because that will take Islamophobia. That will take a few hours, if not days. Speaking of hijab, speaking of hijab, why are the feminists? not only condemning this brutal practice, by, but they're ironically embracing it. In TV commercials, they're trying to make the hijab part of popular culture. What? In the name of diversity. History is important. Why don't they investigate to find out that the hijab was imposed by misogynistic, bearded old men in turbans called Islamic jurists? as a method of controlling women, demeaning them, subjugating them. A symbol of feminism? Oh, come on, people. We really have to wise up and rethink our belief systems. Most importantly, most importantly, how about the gall of the New York Times, that bastion of liberalism and truth? They print, they print that the problem in Iran is purely economic. And if the nuclear deal is revived and we release assets to the Iranian government, all problems will be over. Really? Really? Are people chanting, we want the nuclear deal? Or are they chanting death to the dictator? So the outrageous silence of the West, particularly the US, that talks of justice and human rights has turned a blind eye to Iran while people are slaughtered on the streets in their homes, in universities. At Sharif University, you know what? I'm not even gonna call it Sharif. Its correct original name is Arya Mehr. It's like calling St. Petersburg Leningrad. Anyway, Sharif University, one of the prominent universities at par with Harvard and Stanford. Students have been beaten, detained, shot. Folks, these are the future, these kids are the future assets of Iran that are being spent. And all this is happening while France is meeting with Iranian President Raisi, uh, who's illiterate as you get. Canada is suggesting some soft sanctions and the US president, yes, Mr. Biden is anxious to sign a nuclear deal. Indeed, a partisan agenda. I don't know, maybe it wants, he, it, he wants to leave this kind of a legacy. Why is the IRGC not listed uh, as a terrorist entity? And again, I don't wanna encroach on the other panelists, but I'm sorry, I have to say this, I'm so angry. Why are there children and the children of Mullahs who are preaching piety in Iran, enjoying the good life abroad in the US and Canada, wearing their bikinis and sipping their margaritas by the pool, designer clothes, fast cars, all with money that's been laundered and assets that belong to the Iranian people. Again, look this up, look it up on the internet, look at these privileged kids on social media. The hypocrisy is glaring, my friends. And in the meantime, 
politicians here, instead of enacting the Magnitsky sanctions, they're tolerating the old, stale, broken record of Ayatollah Khamenei attributing the unrest to Zionism or the US. I mean, I don't know why he bothers. Even his own followers don't buy this. So I leave you with this question. Is it convenient for the West to keep this regime in power, in check, but in power? Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. <clears throat> very enlightening, Mitra. Thank you so much uh, for covering um, the background and also the history of Iran leading to uh, today's uh, movement and protests by youngsters on the streets of um, so many cities in Iran. Next, we have um, a young lady, uh, Ms. Nicole Sadiqi, who's second generation of um, journalists from Iran. I've known uh, Mr. Nader Sadiqi and uh, Mrs. Shahla Sadiqi who have been in the news, in the media, in Iran, and also in the United States. Nicole is stepping into footsteps of um, very strong characters, as she is also a freelance journalist, a writer, an advocate of um, human rights. Um, Nicole, the floor is yours. Excuse me, I have to unmute myself. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ms. Mizrahi. Thank you, Mitra, I enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, distinguished guests and uh, University of Los Angeles. President Brown, thank you very much for having us here. And Ms. Uh, Abu Tabeli and Mr. Zand, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important subject, very timely. It's my honor to have this opportunity with you, although um, I'm sure you will agree it's we come together with an empty heart, uh, heavy heart. Masa Amini, a time for change. So my focus this morning is really uh, about the world's reaction uh, and media coverage of the developments in Iran. This is a subject that's uh, pretty multi-layered. And I think it must be approached from several angles. And uh, I shall touch upon the world's political reaction as well as the social reaction and of course the media, which can't be ignored. Now, there was a, a saying that I don't recall where I heard it before, uh, but it goes something like this. Um, all politics is local and all journalism begins with local news. And the media today, uh, more often than not, gets its cues from our political leaders. In light of this, I'll start with some um, updates of what's been happening in the political arena, firstly from uh, international governments and uh, European, uh, particularly the European Union, uh, parliaments and officials have been positive and overwhelming so far which is quite surprising if one refers back to the very close financial ties that the European nations, particularly the EU big three, France, UK and Germany, have had with the Islamic Republic since its occupation of Iran. The parliamentarians, particularly those on the right, who have shown their support for the Iranian people have been accompanied by the pressure and demands of their respective governments. They are asking their governments to enforce new sanctions against the regime. And last week, some 60 members of the European Parliament in a letter asked the EU to recognize the will of the Iranian people for regime change. And uh, just yesterday, EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell told the European Parliament that the bloc would continue to follow what's happening in the country to use every opportunity to raise our position and our concerns on human rights in Iran. 
And the French Foreign Affairs Minister also said the EU countries would consider targeted sanctions against members of the Iranian regime that are killing protesters. This is both a welcome change in rhetoric and a pleasant surprise from our European allies, since we have not seen um, these kinds of actions like this taken by them uh, to such an extent. And honestly, it should be encouraged and extremely welcomed. Although a little late to respond, the United States and Canadian government have stated their support of the people of Iran albeit with tentative caution from their officials. President Biden and his administration officials have all supported the demonstrations in public statements and demanded the regime avoid any brutal response to the protesters. And just yesterday, there was welcome news. The United States announced fresh sanctions against Iranian officials in punishment for the continued violence against peaceful protesters and the shutdown of Iran's internet access, as well as a group of bipartisan senior members of the Senate Foreign Relations have introduced a Senate resolution reaffirming that the United States support for the Iranian citizens uh, protest and condemning the Iranian security forces for their violent response. And of course, an identical resolution has also been introduced in the House of Representatives as well. So far, the congressional members' response has been fairly uniform in condemning the brutal oppression to the peaceful protests of the Iranian people. And once again, we should welcome and encourage such actions toward the right direction. Now, the other layer uh, that I want to uh, address in this topic is the mainstream media's coverage. And for the sake of um, objectivity, there's a couple of points that must be made. Uh, firstly, reporting anything from inside Iran is difficult since US relations with the Islamic Republic have been strained ever since the 1979 hostage crisis. And American reporters can't just fly into Tehran and start asking a bunch of questions uh, without risking their own freedom and personal safety. And uh, on the flip side, you can't report the news if you're not there, but you often can't access if uh, can't get access if you don't make some kind of concessions and compromises with the clerical regime. So it's a double-edged sword. Secondly, it's important to remind ourselves that due to the censorship inside Iran, there have been continuous interruptions of information coming out of the country. However, with the help of experts using strong VPN, access to the internet has successfully been provided for the Iranian people. Now, the media has always played a proactive role in current and world affairs. It can have either both a positive or negative impact, depending on which media we refer to. <laughs> uh, with regards to the recent anti-government uprising, which, has, which was ignited by the murder of 22-year-old Mahsa Amini, the mainstream media has addressed and reported on the recent uprising of the people of Iran. However, and I hasten to add this, it has not been on their list of priorities. There are media covering uh, the Iranian protests, but they have the impression that they may have the impression that it's not exactly a story directly affecting the United States. They report it one time and they move on to the next story. This is, there is no momentum built up with this. As we all know, in the recent months, they have been predominantly focused on the UK, Ukraine and Russia conflict, which has been a very energetically driven headline. Nevertheless, to not give Iran at the very least the same airtime is completely misguided on the media's part. Since Russia uh, is an adversary of the West, then surely, giving as much, if not more attention to the current situation in Iran 
does indeed directly affect the United States, considering, for example, the Islamic Republic recently has provided Russia hundreds of unmanned aerial vehicles, including weapons capable drones for use in its ongoing war in Ukraine. Right now, we are witnessing history in the making, a revolution happening right before our eyes by the freedom loving people of Iran. And sadly, although the media has paid lip service to the people of Iran, they have failed to adequately grasp the true magnitude of what this not only means to the Iranian people, but also to the free world. The media is ignoring the ramifications on this international chessboard and failing to analyze the situation sufficiently since they don't appreciate its importance. This is a regime that is friendly with China and with Russia, both adversaries of the West. The Iranian people don't care for Russia or China and the media is blind to this fact. They simply haven't gotten the message. The fact is the Iranian regime has resorted to brutal suppression of dissidents for almost half a century, including the massacre of tens of thousands of political prisoners since the 1980s and a campaign of censorship and distortion to hide the brutal realities of political freedom in Iran has contributed to this matter. And the lack of Iran expertise in the Western media is rather disappointing and unacceptable. Therefore, for the time being, I personally am not sure if the media will continue their coverage of this historical event. However, we must do our best to encourage them to take that to not to take their eyes off the ball and to continue vehemently to report on the Iranian people's struggle who deserve to be heard. On the social media side, particularly on Twitter, it has been like a tsunami of information flooding in. There is this sense of urgency. And now we have celebrities and the in, uh, entertainment industry showing their support and chiming in too. If you do a quick search on social media, you don't have to be a Pulitzer Prize reporter to see that this uprising is a grassroots movement that has caught the world by surprise. Those of us who have been following these events with bated breath have been retweeting, reposting on social media platforms. And I have to say, unless you follow the Mahsa Amini hashtags on social media, much of the world still has no idea who Massa Amini was, uh, what her death uh, implies, and what's been going on inside Iran. However, by now, everyone pretty much knows everything there is to know about Ukraine. Therefore, in my humble opinion, the media still has its work cut out in reporting on this very leading event. This uprising, which is a grassroots movement led by women and children has caught the world by surprise and the people are defenseless. All they have are their bare hands and their voices and the courage to stand up against a bloodthirsty regime and its barbaric security forces. This demonstrates Iranian people's resolve has reached a crossroad from which they cannot return, even though they risk their very lives in the process. Dozens upon dozens, as young as 13 years old, are being murdered every day, and they are at a precipice. The Iranian people are holding their breath as to what the next step should be for them. The good news is that the regime is weak and it's on its knees. The people of Iran need and deserve our continued support in the free world and continue to echo their voices. Instead of engaging with the Ayatollahs, we need to engage with the Iranian people inside Iran. The matter must be an international agenda of the highest priority, not only for Massa, 
but for all of the Mahsas of Iran. The women of Iran are not only fighting for themselves, but for all of the women of the world. They have only one wish. They want regime change for the people, by the people, and for freedom. Thank you. Wow. Nicole, that was so beautiful, so moving. <clears throat> and you echoed the sentiments of many people that have been silenced for more than 43 years. And finally, thank goodness to our youngsters and their courage. Things are about to change in Iran and their voices cannot be silenced this time because we have social media and we have the persistence and perseverance to get what it's their fundamental rights. Again, you all talked about um, appeasement policy by the West, censorship by the international media, and our misguided uh, leadership, not just in America, but also in the free world, that want to welcome a Rook regime into the community of the nations. It's very sad that they do not hear the voices of people on the ground. Next, we have our eloquent lecturer, Mr. Fahad Mansourian. I've had the pleasure of traveling to Washington, D.C. with him, meeting him in Sacramento to honor and celebrate Nowruz, the Persian um, New Year, and also learn from his analysis and lectures about modern um, history in Iran, politics, and actually his um, in-depth analysis as to what's happening in the Middle East. He is currently a lecturer at Dominican uh, University. And um, I believe his um, last lecture was about um, Iran and the Biden administration. Um, at the end of the program, I would like to share a link of his upcoming lecture too, for those of you who are interested to get more insight as to uh, what's going on inside Iran and the US foreign policy. Mr. Mansourian, thank you so much for joining us today and we would love to hear from you. Greetings, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, University of West Los Angeles, um, President Brown, faculty, and of course, the tremendous staff for uh, giving us this opportunity. You know, it's a privilege to be on a panel. Um, you have heard people who really are passionate and a student of what has been taking place. And um, I want to take you a little bit to a different place today because I think Nicole um, was very right where she said there is a revolution happening before our eyes. I want to I want to add to that. Um, you know, I stay current. There is not a day that I don't speak for half a dozen to dozen of my contacts inside Iran, from uh, military to um, students to family members, and and this is how I keep in touch for my research and analysis. Yesterday, I want to report to you that the Iranian struggle for gaining uh, freedom entered a very different and a new phase. Um, yesterday, tens of thousands of Iranian students in high school um, took their um, uh, veil and their head covering out in classes and tore down the picture of uh, the Ayatollah and poured into the streets um, and started uh, joining their mothers and sisters, even though the mothers and sisters in most cases were objecting because they were fearing for their safety. Um, they basically have said, no, we now understand there is no future with this regime and we cannot remain silent. 
Now, they didn't enter to the streets by asking for a, something very specific, you know? Um, and this is what I wanted to share with you. The current um, uprising in Iran is much different than all other previous uprisings and demonstrations. Here is the difference. In the past, demonstrations would take place because of a specific event. In 2009, um, they engineered an election and, um, and, and we can one day talk about how elections are conducted in Iran because they're truly fascinating engineered on how names come out of um, uh, so-called ballot boxes. But in 2009, they were very specific. Where is my vote? What happened to the election? And in every other major demonstrations, it's been specific. Where is my check? Where is my raise? Um, why the gasoline price doubled overnight? And so on, which those are all very legitimate questions. However, in this particular case, as a result of uh, the final straw that broke the camel's back, which was the murder of this young lady, they now have only one demand, regime change. This is Iranian people in the streets. They no longer want a monetary reward. They no longer want the morality police uh, officials who conducted this murder to, to be tried and executed. They don't even want the morality police altogether to be um, dismantled. They're saying we want the entire regime to be changed. No more Islamic Republic of Iran. We want a free election and we want to choose our own um, form of government. Now, the next thing I want to report to you is what Iranian women and students are doing has already impacted, and I will guarantee you will have major impact throughout the world, especially in Muslim countries, especially in countries where dictators use religion as a form of ideology and as a form of uh, telling you what you think and how you should think it and how you behave because that religion says so. For 1400 years in Muslim countries, dictators have used that ideology on telling um, you know, the women in that country and the girls in that country what to wear, what not to wear, which job you can have, um, which husband you should um, marry, when you should marry, um, and put up with honor killings, put up with child brides, you know, getting married at the age of 13. Um, to somebody who um, paid off um, a local clergy and, um, and, and so on and so forth. We can give you dozens and dozens of examples. And, and everybody thought so powerless. It's like, that's how it is. In Iran, before revolution, women used to be judges, used to be senators, were singers, were dancers. Um, and, and they freely decided which university they go to. Of course, they had to compete to get into them and with major to study. No more, right? All of that has changed. Um, they claim, this is the Ayatollahs, the woman's brain is half the man and therefore you cannot hold certain jobs. You cannot be a judge. You cannot be a president because uh, you just can't think and rash be rational enough. You're just too emotional. Well, and so on and so forth. Now you see Iranian women and girls are challenging that and want the entire fundamental change. This is very, very critical. So what does that mean? That means they want to manage their future. Up to now, their future was in the hand of uh, a male dominant and a government that told them what is their future. Um, and, and now they're saying that is not acceptable. Islamic Republic of Iran, the regime, uh, is really in a very uh, tough position. Tough because 
um, their entire ideology and thinking cannot accommodate any of these demands. And these demands, because they're no longer specific, they cannot just give them a raise or arrest half a dozen people. Um, and, and the Ayatollah and, and his uh, think tank are stuck because they're dealing with a very committed and very brave group of their citizens who want the entire organization change. So uh, even if they want to back down, which uh, my research for over three decades shows they have never backed down, uh, but even if they decide to take any steps, um, that will result into their uh, overthrow very, very quickly. So now let me bring you to a, take you to a different place. So Iranian is now saying, we want change. We want regime change. One of the questions, it keeps coming up in Washington. Yesterday, I was talking to a very prominent um, administration person who immediately turned and said, well, Farhad assumed these guys are changed. What happens next? Well, what happens next is what Iranian people will decide. There is no cookie jar solution for us to pull out of a box and say, well, here is what's going to happen. Iran, before revolution, had a constitution, had 70 years um, of history, and it's based on a constitution. Um, that constitution gives people the right to choose the type of government, whether it will be a president type government or a monarchy government but the constitution gives them that option. Our, our, that constitution exists. It is something that it's inclusive. This is very, very important. Unlike the Islamic constitution, Islamic Republic of Iran, that is constitution that it's excluding people. If you are Jewish and if you're Christian and if you're Baha'is, you cannot do these things. If you're a woman, they cannot do those things. If you are this, you cannot do that. So it's an exclusive type. It keeps people out. The, the constitutional government and the constitutional um, um, document that we have from almost 70 years ago is inclusive. Regardless of your race, ethnicity, or religion, as long as you believe in the sovereignty and the freedom of Iranian people, you can come and compete and be part of that government, which ultimately Iranian people decide uh, which format to have, as I said. Now I wanna take you to a different place, United States and the Biden administration. So, um, you know, the last uh, lecture I was giving was over many, many weeks. So I'm gonna give you the punchline and the conclusion. So White House at this time is very uh, is is behaving very differently than uh, the last two times. Okay? President Biden uh, has immediately embraced the Iranian woman struggle, um, has has imposed immediate sanctions, and is really trying to figure out how to support Iranian uh, Iranians. Um, he has led some sanctions. Um, a goal that has now allowed Iranians to have communication technology. So all of those things are, are uh, we need to praise uh, and we need to recognize, um, you know, because just so you know, whether um, the occupant of our administration of our White House are Democrat or Republican, um, when it comes to foreign policy and when it has come to Iran, it's been really confusion. And the main confusion has been, we have not had a policy. So we always react to an event and then try to figure out what to do. Um, so that's, that is the world with President Biden. But, but President Biden now has a different complicated scenario. One complicated scenario is um, if Iran changes, the regime changes, uh, there are a group of advisors who are telling him, but well, Mr. President, we don't want another Libya. We don't want another Iraq. Um, we don't want ISIS. We don't want civil war. Uh, but those advisors don't know the history of Iran. 
Iran is not Libya. Iran is not Iraq. Iran has been there for thousands of years and is not a tribe type country. They're nationals. And when revolution happened in 1979, uh, they were not civil war. They were not killings. People didn't go and kill ethnic, um, um, ethnicity um, uh, villages. Iranians um, had an uprising for right or wrong, and, and they moved on. So, so that concept, but that concept keeps coming up. It's like, oh my God, you know, what is the plan? Like there is this plan that somebody can pull out and you have a fantastic transition. The next question that has come up is what do we do with the nuclear um, agreement, the JCPOA, right? Um, I believe that continuing to negotiate uh, is good. That is what the State Department does. Uh, we should always negotiate and prevent conflict. However, there is a time that you say, wait a minute, maybe it is time for me to say, I will no longer negotiate unless and until you stop killing your own people. Um, so there is always that, that happy medium, but there are a group of advisors to Mr. Biden who want to continue the nuclear um, negotiations and those talks are going up. But as I pointed out to this administration official yesterday, but be aware that the wrong message that is being sent to Iranian people is very confusing. Iranians in Iran on one hand appreciate what White House is saying and the technology um, release that, that they allow to happen. But on the other hand, when they see you sitting down across the table from the Ayatollah's representatives, and are trying to reach an agreement that could, and this is really critical part of the nuclear agreement, mm -hmm. that could release many billions of dollars to the coffers of the Ayatollahs, which they will only use to shore up their personal account, as well as the, um, the police and the secret service and, and Hezbollah and Hamas, that's where it becomes very, very confusing. Now, President Biden has a third headache now, and that is the Ukraine, the Ukraine war. The reason that has now entered into all these nego negotiations is, as you know, Russia provides gas and, uh, and uh, oil to Europe, as well as to United States. And so we have this dilemma that on one hand, we're spending billions of dollars trying to defeat uh, Putin, on the other hand, um, you know, we'll continue to buy 500,000 um, barrels a day. So what are our options? This is the president has to be looking at. And there are advisors who say, if you have an agreement with Iran, meaning the nuclear agreement, perhaps they can now substitute and provide the oil that we need. So we will not buy from Mr. Putin, which, when I have been in those discussions, I'm saying, so we're substituting one dictator for the next. How, how does that make it better? And yesterday's event has made Mr. Um, Biden's world much more complicated because as you know, um, uh, OPEC announced that they're cutting 2 million uh, barrels a day from the, from the worldwide production, which many people believe that can leave into uh, more economic um, hardship in the United States. Mm -hmm. Again, the Iranian government lovers are saying, see, but Iran can step up and substitute millions of that. So I just wanted you to know that, that how the major policy maker decisions at the, at the highest level have to deal with this multifaceted problem. Um, on one hand, they wanna do the right thing. On the other hand, they have the political, the military, and the economic issues that they have to deal with. So overall, a very, very complicated uh, situation that we are, um, we are um, witnessing. It will continue to become more public, uh, more complicated, not less. But I want to I want to conclude by one thing. Um, you noticed how um, how many. 
uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans became so angry when Supreme Court recently made a ruling about abortion. That was a single topic um, issue. In Iran, um, these, these super brave men, women, and now girls and boys um, are truly taking a risk. Every single day they come out, the secret service of Ayatollah can show up at their house and deal with them, uh, arrest them, and you never hear from them, as well as getting killed on the streets. So I wanna tip my hat off to those brave souls who have decided for the future of their generation and their country that enough is enough and being quiet is no longer an option. So again, thank you for having me here and I'll be happy to be answering any of the questions you might have. Um, <clears throat> Farhad, thank you so much for um, the in-depth information about what's going on on the political side of our administration. And I wanna pose the first question at you. Um, we all know that the inconsistent foreign policy of the United States, regardless of whether we had a Republican or a Democrat president in the White House and the misinformation slash um, censorship that comes from Iran has fed to this notion that the United States is not as mighty as it proclaims. <laughs> but my question to you is, what if the Iranian government comes forward or the Islamic Republic comes forward and says, okay, we heard your message and we are gonna reform our ways. They want hijab, will give them freedom um, of uh, leaving more strands of their hair out. Or if they wanna go to school, they could do it without the permission of the parents. Would that be um, another alternative to um, the form of government that has been reigning over Iran for the past 43 years, 26 years of which was um, presided by the reformists? You know, very good uh, point and question. First of all, we need to understand that the regime of Islamic Republic in Iran is really not a government. The reason I say that is government means that you agree and you obey international laws and you have certain uh, behavioral uh, agreements, right? Um, when Islamic Republic government took place, they are actually a revolutionary organization. What was the first action of Islamic Republic uh, in Iran uh, that took place? was taking Americans hostage, attacking the US embassy, taking Americans hostage. That was the first thing they did, right? Um, and that tells you the entire um, uh, thinking. Um, as a revolutionary organization, they can only survive by not being compromisable, by having very, very solid, and non-flexible sets of rules, and that's how they have done it. But they're very cunning. They are exceptionally smart. And from time to time over the 43 years, they have tried to let the steam out a little bit by bringing the so-called, as you said, moderates. Um, and, um, and three different presidents in Iran were quote unquote moderates but every single one of them has been as right-wing as uh, Islamic uh, Republic organization allows them. And, so, and actually, and, uh, Farha, to add to that, it was President Khatami, a reformist or a moderate who created the entire morality police. This is- Correct. So, so this concept, ab absolutely. So you got to understand, Khatami is an, a, 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 a clergy. Right, I mean, uh, Rafsanjani was was clergy. Rouhani was a clergy. So from from the year of um, you know when you're 14 years old, you go through this process of radical version of Islam that these guys preach, 
And by the time you get into your 60s, you've been completely shaped to that ideology, that extreme ideology. And, you, and every single one of them believes in the concept of um, supreme leader who is God's representative on earth, right? Everything else is just a style, right? They, they dress up nicely and use different words, but the ideology um, has not changed. What I wanted to leave, uh, leave you with to answer that question is, it is not even possible that the current Iranian regime makes any um, um, uh, become flexible and try to peace people. The reason is they will lose their zealot supporters if they start giving the store away. The zealot supporters that these guys have been educating for decades that there is only one way, it's the God's way and it's this way, right? Uh, now, if they start seeing you let those things go, then they will lose control among their people. Uh, they have no choice um, but to continue doing the only one thing they know, which is killing people, torturing people, and hope that this time be just like previous times um, and everything dies down. Um, and even that is possible, but I don't think this dying down means it's gonna be eliminated. I think what the Iranian women and now girls and, and everybody else in Iran have done is the beginning of destruction of the Islamic Republic regime as we see it completely. Thank you. And <clears throat> we look forward to that day sooner than later. Uh, Mitra, my question is uh, to you, um, especially, I want to hear your thoughts uh, on our iconic figures, um, such as Vice President Kamala Harris, Oprah Winfrey, and also our First Lady Michelle Obama. They were spokesperson for the Me Too movement, for a lot of other movements in this country and around the world. How would you justify their silence? How come they're not um, addressing this issue about women in Iran? My feeling is that the um, liberal, and I have to preface this by saying that I'm not I can't, I am an old fashioned liberal. Um, I'm not promoting uh, either party. I don't belong to either party. I'm pretty much an independent. So what I say has just to do, do with my um, experience and, and what I hear. Uh, there is a fringe element uh, to the Democratic Party, the liberals that are extremely afraid of of upsetting any religious sensitivities. So therefore you turn a blind eye when uh, women are being discriminated against because you say, well, that's the way they do it over there. That's their religion. This is, this is their way of, 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 of living. And that is where the hypocrisy comes in. In other words, we have to be bold, we have to be fearless, and we have to uphold our beliefs and our principles of liberty and freedom for all, government for the people, government by the people, and not be afraid of being labeled. Islamophobia has become, and this is what I meant, that it, we really need to spend a, a couple of hours uh, talking about this is that it's becoming such a a a a, a fear of, of of being branded as bigoted as being as being prejudiced as being afraid of a certain uh, of a certain religion or movement we've got to get over that injustice is injustice no matter where it is so many of the um Islamic apologists speak about reform 
in the Islamic countries. Well, I don't understand how you reform what you believe is the word of God, if you believe that that's the case. In other words, here's a situation where the Iranian people are not asking for reform. They're asking to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And we in the West have to be brave enough to support that, especially if we call ourselves feminists. And again, this is not just a feminist movement. This, it's, it's, it's started there, it's absolutely started there, and women are at the forefront of the revolution. But the fact of the matter is that we have to not be afraid. And I'm not proud of the fact that Michelle Obama or uh, Kamala Harris or Oprah and many other women who are proponents of the feminist movement in this country, the Me Too movement in general, who are not supporting this uh, 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 freedom uh, movement in Iran. And that's- Thank you. Um, I will uh, pose my last question and Nicole and um, Shay, we can later on um, um, open up uh, the mic to anybody who may have uh, questions from uh, the audience. Nicole, I wanna go back to um, the recent movement again the Me Too movement. How should we interpret the acts of our feminist figures, such as Leslie um, Stahl from 60 Minutes, um, CBS, covering her hair just to have an opportunity to interview President Raisi um, of Iran knowing well enough that for the past 43 years, women in Iran have been at the forefront of uh, resistance and fights against the Islamic Republic for the issue of hijab. What is this double standard or selective feminism that we encounter on a daily basis? That's a good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I feel from the media's standpoint that the mainstream media is very commercialized. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, there's no uh, responsible old school, professional, independent journalism. Um, and it's virtually non-existent. Commercialization has gotten involved into the nitty gritty of financial competition. And so they run like businesses that are committed to their own agendas rather than informing uh, the public of the real news. And every media has its own agenda, whether it's 60 minutes, um, either open or hidden. And the preferences are also there for the reporting as the, the example you just gave. Um, and prominence is given uh, to such news uh, to form opinions rather than to really tell the truth. Um, this also, like I said, uh, you know, the, the media does take its cues from the world leaders too. Uh, so um, there is an iron curtain that needs to be pulled, that is, it's across Iran that needs to be pulled away. And um, this is where the international governments can, can take more actionable steps um, so that the media can then also take follow through with reporting um, on those actionable steps that would you know, benefit uh, the Iranian people. So uh, wearing a um, hijab to a, an interview while women are literally like Masa Amini dying, being killed, brutally tortured, raped, killed on the streets of Iran is a disservice, not only to um, women across the world, but also uh, to journalism. So it's a problem. I think the trends of uh, Me Too movement are just that. Um, you know, I think it's wonderful that we see celebrities and actors 
uh, taking a stance and using their platforms um, without really, again, I emphasize having an in-depth um, understanding of why they're even standing up for such a thing. And again, the media has failed in its um, job. They have one job to do, which is, which is report the correct news without kowtowing, without being bullied um, into silence. Um, so it's a problem, but um, we have to keep encouraging them. We have to keep having this discussion on all levels from all aspects. And um, we all have to unite as one voice and let them know that they're doing a disservice to, um, you know, to, to, to the people of Iran and to facts and the truth. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, I agree. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the Walter Conkites of um, the world anymore uh, to come and say it as it is. Um, everybody is so concerned about um, the ratings and, and being popular and making sure they don't offend um, anybody's sensitivities. Um, Shay, if you want to open up um, uh, the program to questions from the audience, um, please go ahead. But in the meantime, I do want to add on to the fact that as of this moment, there are more youngsters being arrested, brutalized, killed. The morgues in Iran are filled with mostly um, youngsters ages 13 to 26. These are very young, compassionate uh, children, the youth, the future of any civilization or country that are being mutilated, being brutalized, violated, raped, sodomized, and harmed by the very elements that are supposed to be protecting and defending them. So staying silent is not an option. We all need to speak up. And I am grateful to UWLA for offering this platform to us and many other people to be able to speak out about the atrocities that are being committed in Iran. So, um, Shay, you want to uh, go ahead with the next question? Sure. So, uh, hi, thank you so much, everyone. So, I actually have a student who I believe is raising their hand. So, I'm going to allow um, Dean Frickberg to um, allow the participants to ask the questions by raising their hands. Uh, Mr. Fred, the floor is yours. I believe your hand is up. So please go ahead and ask your questions from the panelists. Okay, we will go to the next student. Um, the name on your, your hand is up, L-O-C-A-D-M. Please go ahead. Hello, I, my question is for Farhad Mansourian. I, my question is whether the uprising in Iran is just the smart hip set in Tehran and the other major cities or whether it's also extended out to the countryside. If the discontent is also in the countryside, in the rural areas, then I think the regime would be in real danger. You know, excellent. Should I go ahead and answer? Please. You know, excellent question. Um, it started from major cities and it now has spread to all uh, over Iran. Um, it just so you all know, Iran is the size of Texas, so it's a very large, a lot of rural as well as major cities. As a matter of fact, a lot of people might not know, but the young lady Mahsa who got killed 
was actually a Kurd, one of the ethnicities in Iran. And, um, and, but, but it was the heinous crime that gave everybody across Iran um, the anger. Uh, also, I want to share with you that um, in, there are two major holy cities um, in Iran. One is Mashhad and one is in Rom. And in both of these cities, who are exceptionally right-wing conservative religion, there has been demonstrations and, and against the regime. And actually, last week, a grand ayatollah in Qom, uh, which is huge, came out and, and warned the security forces from stop killing our youth um, and, and youngsters. It was really amazing. So, so we're beginning to see cracks, not holes yet, but cracks even, even among the religion readers as well as the um, uh, government leaders because they're seeing something they've never seen before uh, for this long. We're in the third week now, so I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there is uh, uh, there are a few more questions that are being posted in the chat for the panelists. Um, if you guys are not able to see the questions, I'd be more than happy to read them. But if you can look in the chat, the questions are there. And whoever would like to answer, please feel free. Um, you know, I'll take the lead that there is a question saying there is currently no leaders. Um, and then uh, the question is, you know, how do you go on and should we go write a new constitution? Um, I, this is the old fashioned way, very good question, but in a modern way, uh, modern era, you no longer first come up with a leader and say, I am the leader and everybody follow me. No, you have to earn that. And we need to understand that the changes in Iran is not about a person, it is about the system. So Iranians are saying, we don't want the system of Islamic Republic with a Supreme Leader. And the replacement is what I talked about is in 1906, Iranians after a hundred year of fighting created a constitution that is inclusive, right? Is the Mashru'iyat. And, and Mashru'iyat or that constitution can go through the process and leaders will come up. So the day after the Ayatollah's regime is overthrown, Iran still has a system. As a matter of fact, the system that there is there with a lot of changes, of course, was the same system that it was before. So it's not like the regime will be overthrown tonight and tomorrow, what are we gonna do? And the whole world is gonna come to an end. No, the system continues. You will go and start having um, first people will decide down the road whether they want a constitutional monarchy or they want a constitutional um, president or a prime minister. And um, so that is the process that is going to take place. The constitution is written, it's already there, and Iranians um, can go study it. And it's an Iranian constitution not something that was exported from outside and imposed on Iranians. I want to also say that um, I think most Iranians want a referendum, a referendum so that they can decide what kind of government they want. Now would be a very bad time for the different factions to uh, start promoting their own form of government, where, whether it's going to be a, a, a Soviet-backed uh, party like the Tudé party or the monarchists who are dead uh, set against having a, a monarchy. Now would be a very, very bad time for these uh, people to start promoting their own way of government. Referendum, I think, is what most of the Iranian people want. I mean, if you go back to the way the United States was formed, if I had a penny for every time an Iranian person said, said uh, well, if the mullahs goes away, go away, who's going to take their place? Uh, because uh, we're always looking for a leader, but this is not the 1700s or the 1600s. The fact of the matter is that 
just like the way that the United States was formed, representative government, the founding fathers came together, election of a president, the formation of a new country. Uh, the constitution is there, but it, if it needs to be revised or reformed, it is no longer the word of God, but it is a, 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 a man-made constitution that can be altered, that can be uh, changed, so I believe a referendum is what most of the uh, Iranians, the youth who are highly educated, I think that that's what they are demanding. Um, ironically, Mitra, when you talk about the framers of the US Constitution, it is good for the audience to know that our framers were inspired by an ancient king, Cyrus the Great, to format the US Constitution. And now it's time for the United States to reciprocate what uh, Persians or Iranians offered uh, 200 or 250 years ago. Um, there is this question which I think somebody should um, address. And um, I'm sorry, I just... Um, missed it. Uh, I can read it for what, you, the next question. Uh, yeah, the one about to what degree would the regime be willing to compromise in order to preserve itself? Um, uh, Nicole Farhad or Mitra, would you? Uh, Nicole, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think uh, that's, um, I've had that question before and it's uh, even been entertained by, you know, foreign governments too um, in their foreign policy, Iran policies. Um, you know, can they, again, this comes back to, can we again negotiate with the regime? Um, can we come to some kind of a compromise based on, you know, our, uh, persuasiveness and good nature. Unfortunately, you're dealing with um, a, a the nature of the regime. They're very deceitful. History has taught us that for 43 years. They never keep their end of the bargain. And um, they've time and time again used all uh, avenues of tricking the West uh, into thinking that, yes, we can reform, we can compromise. And what that's done is only bought them more time to survive um, and to uh, gain more access to finance in order to de destabilize the region, in order to fund uh, and support proxy wars and terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. And again, at the expense of the Iranian people uh, who just want freedom who love the West and want to be part of the free international community. And I have to say, at the expense of the uh, United States of America and Europe, um, lest we forget how many times they've, how many American lives have, have been lost at this regime. This idea that perhaps we can uh, uh, keep hopeful with this regime. No, uh, that we have to learn from history. And the madness is trying to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's not going to happen. And we have to realize that the people in Iran know better than anyone in the world the nature of this uh, clerical regime. They know uh, how brutal, how barbaric, how deceitful, um, and how malign they are. And uh, they only have their own self-interests to um, survive at the expense of the world. Um, you know, look at what they're doing to their own people, let alone the rest of us. So uh, I think that um, subject uh, has been tried uh, with all the good intentions and has failed uh, that policy that of, of expecting them to compromise. They're just not going to do it. And uh, if someone shows you who they are the first time, believe them. So. I mean yeah. Yeah. Let me add to that as well. You know, Islamic Republic of Iran regime is not capable of reforming itself and modifying itself. If it wants to do that, let's start with that, right? Supreme leader is not an elected person. 
right? Iranian people did not pick this guy and say, you're God's representative on earth. The other senior clergies did. So the very first thing, it, let's, let's just open this up for 30 seconds. Even if they want to change their constitution and say, you know what? I'm sorry, but Supreme Leader, people seem not to like you. It's time to change you, right? The very first thing according to their constitution is the Supreme Leader has to authorize such a proceedings. So imagine a Supreme Leader that everybody says we need not to have Supreme Leader anymore, but maybe, maybe may we have your blessing and permission to get rid of your position. No, the system is created from top to bottom and doesn't care what people want because any change they make, they believe will make their system weak and vulnerable and very quickly um, can be eliminated. And, and too many lives have been lost, even if it were possible to compromise, which is definitely not possible, but too many lives have been lost. Too many people have died and it would be an insult to their memory to even attempt such a thing. Uh, so as everyone on the panel agrees, no, it is not possible to reform the system. Actually, one thing that I wanna add, um, even if there are people in the audience um, that um, subscribe to um, isolationism and that America should not care about what's happening in Iran. This is their business, that's an internal issue and that America should not meddle into it. Just look at the history of the Islamic Republic in the past 43 years. The Islamic Republic was financier mm -hmm. of terrorist acts against American um, army, military, and civilians. We lost more than 300 Marines in Lebanon because of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Most of the terrorist activities that took place in different countries, US embassies, and the Navy um, in 2000, um, I believe it was 1995 during um, Clinton administration. September 11, most of the victims were Americans. Okay, we lost more than 3,000 American citizens because the Islamic Republic harbored members of Al Qaeda, provided them passports, funding, and other benefits. Most of the roadside bombings in Iraq targeting um, US military personnel had the name of the Islamic Republic written on it. So this is not just about women in Iran. It's not about the issue of Iranian people wanting a change. If you want to have stability, if you want to be able to travel around the world using a US passport, you do want to take the side of uh, this cause that is taking place in Iran. And remaining silent is not an option. As we are talking, youngsters mm -hmm. are facing dire harm. Nobody knows about the photojournalist, Nilou Farhamedi, who took the picture of Masa Amini in the hospital, and she is the one who exposed this atrocity to the world. She's in jail. Nobody knows what has happened to her. Parents of um, Nika Shakrami didn't know what happened to this 16-year-old youngster when she wanted to join the protest. It was only two weeks later that they were able to take her body from the morgue. The mother tells the story of the broken limb, the crushed head. And yet when they wanted to do a proper burial, they were instructed doing so 
would harm them even more. They arrested her aunt and her uncle. Mr. Sherwin Hajipul composed a song. It's called Baraye, which means for. And it gave rise or voice to this movement. He's been arrested and he's in jail. Mr. Alimi Karimi, an iconic soccer player who spoke for his people, had to flee Iran after they confiscated his home. The stories are far too many. The, main, the names are many that will not fit into today's program. So if you don't want to do it for the sake of women in Iran, or the um, people inside Iran, let's do it for ourselves. We want to have a safe America and we cannot make that happen unless each and every one of us assumes uh, the responsibility. If you have any further uh, questions, please go ahead. Sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> Uh, there is a question that was asked that I'm going to go ahead and say on here. Um, one of the questions is, how can Americans here in the United States support the people of Iran right now? You know, maybe I, I'll, oh, go I'll ahead. take the lead on that. Um, you know, excellent question. Um, you can become their voice because you're not being haunted in the streets here, you're not being arrested in the streets here, so you can be their voice. So how does that work? Through your local, regional, state, and federal representatives. You need to let LA Times know, for those of you who are in Los Angeles, uh, why are you not covering um, if they were uh, demonstrations, as somebody said, there were 50, 500,000 Iranians all over the world. And I'm sure there was a big demonstration in Los Angeles. Was that covered? Was it not covered? And become their voice. The national security interest of United States, as we speak today, is completely in line with what Iranians are demanding on the streets. Mm -hmm. They are exactly the same thing, okay? And that's the best thing. So become an activist by contacting your federal, state, your newspapers, your universities, put on more panels and let people know why it is critical to um, make sure that Iranian um, voice is heard everywhere. Because of, think about this, what if Iran was free? How, how, secure would that region be? How secure would that whole Middle East be? And if you had somebody who had a, a good policy towards their energy, um, how much can we in the West benefit from that? So there are many, many um, outcomes of a free Iran that will have um, worldwide impact and it will impact our pocketbooks right here in California and in the United States because of a free Iran will make sensible decisions about energy, environment, human rights, uh, international relationship, and so on and so forth. I'd like to add to that by saying that write to your congressman, write to your local politicians, write to the federal government and ask that they revoke the visas of the children, the offspring, people that are connected to the regime who are thriving here, who have businesses. Uh, the, the, many of them are physicians. Make sure that their patients know who these people are. Many of them have businesses that they've set up with, with uh, Iranian money that's been laundered make sure that their suppliers, make sure that they, that they know who they are. And as I mentioned before, why are we not enacting the Magnitsky, uh, it's, it's M-A-G-N-I-T-S-K-I sanctions. If you look that up, uh, that pretty much entails being able to deport individuals who come from these kinds of regimes and are free to have commercial 
and industrial activities in the United States. That would be a, a, one of the things that the Americans can do, the public can do. Thank you very much. Um, I think this next question is going to be for Nicole. Um, Nicole, please speak on the diversity that is the Iranian people, because sadly, most Americans only see the news media's portrayal, portrayal of religious extremists in the region. So can you please touch on that? Yes, I mean, that's a that's a huge subject. Uh, another two hours it's needed, but briefly, Iran, uh, you know, the misconception is that um, it's uh, they compare it with other Middle Eastern nations, and it's uh, very unique in itself. has a very rich, long history of um, more than maybe even twenty five hundred uh, thousand um, twenty five hundred years, um, and it's very diverse. We have um, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have uh, Jewish people, we have Baha'is, we have the Zoroastrians who uh, represent the oldest religion in Iran actually before Islam. And uh, we have many different, um, I want to say ethnicities, I wanted to say races, but it's really ethnicities both in the North, East, South, West, um, and they have different dialects. Um, you know, my friend sometimes uh, asked me, there's a football player, I forget his name. He looks very Asian, uh, as in Eastern Asian. We, in the North, we have a lot of people who look that typical Asian. In the, in the South, we have more of the Arabic speaking Iranians. We have the, the Kurdish who Masa Amini was, the Kurdish people are uh, actually the original Persians, if you really want to go back. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the next question for any of the panelists will be, will the internet access Starlink by Elon Musk be a factor now in helping the Iranian people as compared to the Green Revolution in 2009? Um, I can be brief on that. It will be crucial because one of the tactics that the uh, Ayatollah's um, security services use is preventing um, Iranians to um, talk to one another, to um, have a conversation and exchange information and inform the media. And uh, they um, have brought massive technology from uh, China uh, that deals with uh, preventing cell phones to work as well as blocking and slowing down internets. So having a counter to that, uh, which is one of the things that, um, uh, that has started, will be tremendous. It will be uh, very, very critical because as you know, communication is everything. And, um, and we're hoping that um, this will be um, a significant uh, tool for them, um, for the people in Iran. Um, and actually, we need to add on to the fact that in the past few days, after Elon Musk um, agreed to um, avail um, Starlink um, inside Iran, um, they've been delivering uh, the equipment through the borders on mules, donkeys, and uh, whatever avenues possible. So you can imagine the plight of Iranians trying to uh, continue on with their struggle and revolution against the Islamic Republic. They are adamant and they're fierce in making sure that uh, this government or this regime will no longer be. Um, any other questions, Shay? Um, at this time, there are no other questions unless the, any of the attendees would like to raise their hands right now. Um, otherwise, we are done with the questions. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you. Uh, Mitra, I wanted to ask you a question. And um, that is about um, the issue of um, political correctness when it comes to uh, people talking about uh, freedom for women inside Iran. Uh, what is it that the Iranian women have been doing in the past 43 years 
just to have their independence or fundamental rights uh, expressed inside the country. I, the newer, the new generation obviously has access, has had access to the internet and they see what's going on in the world. Women presidents, women attorneys, and so these are, these are the desires of the women inside Iran. When I, when I think about Iran, my mother, for example, who went to law school in Iran and would have become an attorney in Iran had we not moved in 1964 to the United States. My aunts who were all educated who became teachers, university teachers, principals. This is the kind of freedom and choice of career that the women have wanted in Iran. The most amazing fact is that in these past 43 years, Iranian women have attended university at a higher rate than men. In other words, there were more women enrolled in universities in Iran than there were men. Although they had nothing to look forward to, they didn't have careers to look forward to, but they never let themselves slide. Their education was very important to them. And so now having graduated, they seek the same opportunities that women around the world have. And so, I, I, have to, I have to be very proud and congratulate the brave women of Iran who actually even through history have played a role in leadership. There have been women queens, women leaders of, of uh, ancient Iran. Uh, Persepolis, which is um, as important as the Pantheon in archaic history had women engineers who were actually, uh, who had men and workers working under them. So Iran has had a long history of brave and proud women. And the Islamic regime has not been able to dampen that spirit. Thank goodness. That's my, uh, my, uh, contribution to uh, women. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you, Mitra. Um, my special thanks to Mr. Farhad Mansourian. And uh, if um, Shave would be kind enough to post a link that I'm gonna send to you in case anybody is interested to attend his upcoming lecture. Um, um, you know, it was wonderful to have you as part of our panel. Um, Mrs. Mitra Benejad, another eloquent speaker that agreed to join us today. And of course, uh, Ms. Nicole Sadiri, uh, whose um, beautiful voice and contributions always uplift our spirit um, and gives us hope to the future generation of Iranians that remain active. Um, I also want to thank uh, UWA uni uh, University Law School staff, faculty, professors, and um, technical staff for offering us this platform. And Shay, my special thanks to you for initiating this subject matter and pushing me uh, to do this uh, uh, in the past two weeks, despite all the um, events that were happening. Um, and at last, God bless America and prayers for a free Iran. Thank you. Thank all. you very much. Thank you. This panel will be recorded and posted on all of our platforms. And um, we would love to have Mr. Mansurian's link as well so that we can share that with our um, community. Thank you all very much for being here. This has been a wonderful educational moment for everyone. Thank you for helping us amplify the voices of those of our brothers and sisters back, into, back in Iran. And um, we are hoping and praying for a free Iran. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.